this is episode 81 of the Real World Wellness Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Lehman, a nutritional therapy practitioner and the reverse diabetes coach, which is also the name of my website. I am accepting a limited number of clients with chronic conditions this month. If you need help, please use the contact form on my website. I help clients with type 2 diabetes, obesity, and autoimmune conditions. I also wanted to mention that there's a slight change in topics. Uh, This episode I had mentioned I was going to talk about osteopenia and osteoporosis related to bone health, and I've decided to move that to next week's episode. Today I'm really delighted to have one of my favorite vendors from my local farmer's market in Old Town Alexandria on the show today. Kinley Coulter and his wife Rebecca own Coulter Farms in Honey Grove, Pennsylvania and have seven children who play an active, integral role on their farm. Together they make and sell certified organic 100% grass-fed beef and lamb and 100% grass-fed dairy products including milk, cheese, yogurt, and ice cream. And they also sell chickens and turkeys at various times as well as pork, so quite a variety of animal products. So, welcome Kinley. Yeah, thank you Christine, glad to be on your on your podcast. Yeah, this is a little bit of a change from uh, coming to the farmers market where we both were, I know you were there this morning in Old Town Alexandria. So I was wondering if you can give our listeners just an idea of where your farm is located in Pennsylvania. I know you make the trek um, down to the uh, Old Town Farmer's Market on Saturday, so I was always curious how long that took. <laughs> yeah, it's about a two-hour and 40-minute drive, um, 150 miles. And is your farm located near Harrisburg? We would be just about dead center of Pennsylvania. We're halfway between Harrisburg and Penn State. Okay, and for people who don't know where Penn State is, where is that? And that would be two hours west of Harrisburg. Okay, so I kind of think, so you're, are you in central Pennsylvania, or do, is that correct, or are you more in south central Pennsylvania? No, it would be central. Okay, all right. So you must get up pretty early to get to the farmer's market, which I know people set up around 8. Is that about right for you? Yeah, the market is open from 7 to 12. We, the alarm clock goes off at 2 o'clock. Oh my goodness. And we, we <laughs> get loaded and on the road for 3 and need to be set up for 7. That's amazing. And you do that every week, it seems like. We do. We have four farm markets, two on Saturday and two during the week. Oh, I didn't realize you did two on Saturday. Where is the other one? The other one is in Silver Spring. Oh, okay, Silver Spring, Maryland. So you got to—that's not—that's about another forty-five-minute track, but at least that's along uh, closer to Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's actually a half hour closer to us. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, where do you go during the week? On Tuesday, we're at Crystal City, which is near the Pentagon. Mm-hmm. And on Thursday, we're at Boston. Those are both Arlington County. Right, and for our listeners who are not familiar with even Alexandria, Arlington County, um, and Fairfax County, these are all suburbs in Northern Virginia, where I live as well. So I was wondering, um, Kenley, if you could tell us the story of how did you and your wife come to own Coulter Farms, and, you know, are you one of these farmers that's had a farm, you know, in your background for generations, or just give us an idea of how this came to pass. Sure. Well, we, uh, my wife and I have been married 32 years. Wow, congratulations. And, uh, we, we spent a short time working in our fields. My wife has a social work degree, a BS, and I have a BS in chemical engineering. And both of us were kind of drawn back to our roots on the farm. And after about five years in our fields, kind of paying off our degrees and trying to justify the time we spent. We went through a short time in a small business and then bought the farm here in Juniata County, Pennsylvania in 1999. Hmm. So we've been here 18 years and through the process of raising our family and our children, 
realized we wanted to do something that children would have the option to stay on and work with us in. And so we started when we had young children, we were able to handle chickens and a family milk cow. And that kind of evolved into sheep as the children were old enough to help with meat sheep. Um, got into raising grass-fed beef and at that time certified organic uh, that would have been like 2004. And then as the boys got older, we have our oldest son just got married. About five years ago, we got into dairy farming. We started a Jersey dairy cow herd by raising calves um, and certified the herd. And we are five years now into milking, producing our own milk, and we've decided we want to market our own products, which is challenging, but it's rewarding. We started out making raw milk cheeses, which is the lowest level, the fewest number of hurdles as far as government regulation to make raw milk cheeses that are aged at least 60 days. Mm. We do that without a pasteurizer and without... Uh, antibiotic testing without uh, pathogen testing. It's a pretty low bar to be permitted to make raw milk cheeses. Um, we found those were doing well for us at farm market and we decided to move into pasteurizing, which opened up ice cream and yogurt for us. Hmm. And those are grade B dairy products, which are a little higher standard, a little more regulation, a little more complexity with the whole pasteurization technology. Um, that went on a couple years and we were able to get our grade A certification, which is the highest level of regulation and controls. But with grade A, we can bottle fluid milk, we can make soft, fresh cheeses, we can um, do butter and cream and basically any dairy product, and we can sell it in 50 states, so that lets us cross state lines with our products, and we've chosen to take them to the, as you said, the suburbs of Northern Virginia. Right, right, which I'm really glad you do because I am the beneficiary. <laughs> Of, of some of these, you know, many of your wonderful products. Um, so we're kind of jumping into dairy, and I was going to ask you, uh, what is the difference then between grade A and grade B in terms of the sure, process? Grade B is a manufacturing grade milk. Um, milk that is poor quality uh, as far as either age or bacterial content. Um, can slip from grade A to grade B, and then grade B milk can be used to make manufactured dairy products, which uh, ice cream and cheese might surprise people to know that uh, a lot of times those products are made with, I don't want to say leftover or number two milk, but that's a little bit what it is, uh, bottled milk. Right. Grade A products would have the, the highest bar for quality. So the grade A, because I think we talked about that once, is that more the has the homogenized process? No, we're not required to homogenize. It's mostly a matter of uh, uh, being certified to be able to ship milk interstate. I see. What about the pasteurized process, pasteurization? Okay, well grade B would still include pasteurization and that what that looks like for us is a vat with a hot water jacket that can heat the milk to a minimum of 145 degrees for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's considered a low temperature pasteurization. It's the lowest legal. And beyond that, there are higher and higher levels. There's um, HTST, high temperature short time pasteurization, which is a hotter pasteurization. There's also ultra high temperature, which would be what most organic milk on store shelves is pasteurized to. That's 
a UHT. If you look at your organic milk bottle, if it says UHT pasteurized, that's ultra high temperature. But and at that point, milk is sterile. Our, our pasteurization leaves a living food. It's not obviously as living as it was when it was raw, but it hasn't been broken down as far as being sterilized and deactivating all the enzymes. Right, because they have beneficial effects, so I think that's a positive thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We feel like it's a good balance between food safety and maintaining the integrity of, of a, a living food. Mm-hmm. Because we also it's know... Kind of a, it's kind of a fortuitous thing that pasteurization, the very first things killed at the lowest temperature are the pathogenic, dangerous bacteria because the healthy bacteria that we'd be happy to have remain in the milk can still live at temperatures that kill the pathogens. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking about, that we want the healthy bacteria but not the unhealthy or the pathogenic bacteria. And I would think that plays out also with cheeses um, in the aging process. Sure. Our cheeses are actually don't undergo any pasteurization. We heat them to a maximum of 102 degrees, which is essentially blood temperature, body temperature. And so all of the enzymes, all of the bacteria, the milk remains intact. Of course, when it's in the cow, it's at 100 degrees. And uh, cheese making, raw milk cheese making doesn't exceed that. Huh, I didn't know that there was a that temperature involved in the cow. That's kind of interesting. Just naturally, yeah. it's 100 degrees. Basically, human body temperature cows run a couple degrees warmer. I see. So when I think of the aging, because there's, I noticed on your website too, it says fresh cheese, and, um, and then there's the aging of the cheese. And does that sort of uh, equate with the fermentation process? What goes on with the aging? I mean, or is sure. it... Sure. Well, fermentation is what's happening in, not only in the cheese fat, but also in the aging room. Uh, bacteria that produce acid and break down proteins are working on the milk and lowering the pH, and that causes coagulation, which is basically a precipitation or a flaking of the milk. And then we're able to drain the, the thin liquid that's left as whey. We're able to drain and press that out. And what remains then is the cheese that still has these bacteria living. And the bacteria are just like us as far as living and breathing and giving off waste products and acting on their environment and changing their environment. And that's what we're doing when we age cheese is using the respiration byproducts and the waste products from these bacteria and even the dying and decaying bacteria as they go through their generations and life cycles. All of that acts on the cheese and adds flavors and textures that can't be reproduced in the lab. They're just impossibly complex. Mm-hmm. So how long do you typically age your cheese, or does it vary? Well, we're required to have 60 days of aging to make the cheese legal to sell when we make raw milk cheeses. After 60 days, we're legal to sell. There's very few cheeses that are fit to eat in 60 days. Um, very bland, very mild, kind of a rubbery texture. If that's what some people like, uh, just a really mild, mild cheese, that would be a 60-day cheese. We have three-month to six-month cheeses that would be more like a Gouda or a Jack, and those start to develop some character and some flavor in that time, and then we'll age out to one to four years with cheeses like Swiss's, Gruyere's, um, we make a tone. Um, these are cheeses that can improve in quality almost indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So I buy your Swiss cheese. Um, it tends to be somewhere in the, it's not the hard cheese. 
Um, so is that the one um, that, do you sell two different kinds of Swiss cheese? One is an aged and one is not? We do. One is baby Swiss, and that's a Swiss that is uh, packaged in five pound blocks, vacuum packed and aged anaerobically, that is without oxygen. Um, that's what I get. That, yeah. That would be a baby Swiss. Mm -hmm. We also make an Emmentaler Swiss, which is a cave aged natural rind cheese, and that's aged aerobically, and we encourage bacteria to form a rind and then cultivate that rind, the bacteria on that rind work on the cheese and you end up with, even though they're both Swisses, the baby Swiss is a Swiss style cheese, but Emmentaler would be a true cave aged Swiss. Mm. And they're both really good, having tried both, but they have a different texture. Um, the aged one is harder, as I recall. Yeah, the aging process dries a cheese, and so you'll notice the dryness right away. And mm. then beyond that, all the enzymatic mechanical work that the bacteria are doing on the wheel of cheese makes significant changes to the taste. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were talking about uh, removing the whey, um, I couldn't help but think of the curds, you know, and <laughs> part of it's, there's a nursery rhyme about curds and whey, but right. also you sell cheese curds. We do. So what, you want to explain that a little bit? Are they the leftover, the, the sort of the leftover cheese, or is that something? No, they're actually kind of a primitive cheese. It's a fresh cheese. We use pasteurized milk, and that lets us sell them fresh. We make the curds, uh, uh, they're produced weekly and only last, they have a seven day shelf life. So uh, it makes a nice cheese, but it's kind of unhandy for us because we have to keep it moving. We're a cheddar, we can go get it any time over five years. Right, exactly. We make curds and it rains that week at farm market where you're done. We're home with the cheese and goes <laughs> to the pig. Right, I was going to say that you must have some good leftovers. <laughs> we do. Our pigs eat really well for so our children. <laughs> kind of a, a fine line between what's first quality market and what's second quality leftovers, and then at some point it crosses the line and becomes pig food. Right, right. So I know you also sell yogurt. You, um, the other day I bought your blueberry um, kefir. And that was delicious. So, um, is that something recent where you're combining more flavors with the um, the kefir, which is for listeners who may not be familiar with? It's kind of a liquid yogurt. Yeah, the whole fermented milk field is really a, a growth area for us. We're seeing uh, a lot of volume developing in that area. We started with yogurt, which would be the most familiar fermented milk to people. We use a uh, yogurt culture that has four live strains of probiotic species in it. The kefir would have upwards of 50 live strains. So the diversity is, is a nice feature to the kefir and also uh, we appreciate the, the stronger probiotic population. We, we ferment the milk further in kefir. It's a, more tart, more fluid drink. It's a drink and not a custard, more like a yogurt would be. Right. And people seem to really appreciate that. No one is looking for a lot of sugar these days, and everyone is looking for probiotics, and we're starting to understand that we don't need a billion of four kinds of bacteria in our gut. We would do better to have a trillion of 50 kinds of bacteria, and so mm -hmm. for kind of Right, and that's that's um, you're pointing out a very important um, topic here, which is the strains of probiotics and the difference between even a brand that I recommend like Faye, but that's store bought, um, which might have three strains of it um, compared to what you're doing with your kefir. And I wasn't aware that it had so many strains. Um, I take a probiotic 
super high quality supplement just because it has so many many more strains of um, in it but now that I know this about your kefir I'm going to <laughs> maybe just switch over um, so you're also going to make ice cream when do you start selling that uh, we have ice cream available now we don't really push it and market it into warmer weather because frankly there aren't many people thinking about ice cream when it's cold right and today it was around in the 50s high of 60 right now but it's uh, it's not quite I agree with you I, I like ice cream when it's more in the summer when it's even warmer um, and are you using can you tell us just briefly how what goes into that sure our goal with ice cream was to make an old-fashioned a true old-fashioned farm style ice cream that uh, is not very similar to what anybody can buy on store shelves it doesn't have the fluffy lightness and the mouth feel that comes with a lot of the additives and emulsifiers even an organic uh, ice cream will frequently have an uh, ingredient list that runs to 12 to 20 ingredients. So we have four ingredients. We have whole milk, cream, um, sugar. Ah, now I should quick be able to come up. We use a, a gelatin. Okay. We have... Uh, very simple, kind of primitive ice cream that would have been ice cream that was familiar to people 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. We use more advanced equipment to produce it, but it actually hasn't been a big hit. It's probably our, our poorest selling line as far as trying to build the business. Ice cream is a real challenge. For starters, people at farm market aren't necessarily looking for a zero degree product that as soon as they get they should be home in 15 minutes um, in right. addition to that it, it does not have the texture and feel that people used to store bought ice cream would be familiar with anyone who's made ice cream themselves at home with simple wholesome ingredients would recognize right away the taste and the texture and mm -hmm. that's what our product is well, I'm definitely going to try it. I, it sounds like something maybe my grandparents might have, you know, had, and I'm always curious about, you know, I've read about it, that more home homemade ice cream. So I definitely want to try it. Um, I wanted to go back to a little bit more about your history. Um, one of the things that, you know, we've talked about, which is maybe a little unusual, <laughs> is our faiths. Um, I know you're Mennonite and um, I wondered if you could just talk about that briefly and what influence that might have had on some of your farming decisions. Sure. Um, well, historically Mennonites have been uh, stewards of the land. They, for 500 years since the 16th century, have been the people that have been called into troubled agricultural areas by the Tsar of Russia or the Archduke of Austria or wherever they've been when there's a need to develop and cultivate agricultural areas that are threatened and suffering, whether from war or plague or uh, environmental stresses. So there's a long heritage in the, among the Mennonites of being farmers and not just kind of status quo farmers, but uh, rescue farmers. Hmm, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a day when those skills that are in our genetics and in our heritage are really being called to the fore because there's a tremendous amount of damage been done by conventional uh, industrial agriculture. Yes. And we are here in an area that had been worked over pretty good with row crops on thin soils and steep ground that had no business being farmed that way. So returning to a pastoral kind of farming and an organic farming, or there's nothing new about organic. Organic is actually very old. The idea to 
Now, are you part of a Mennonite community um, up in, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Juniata County? Um, Juniata County. Juniata yes. County. Because I know um, from what I've read and heard that Mennonite farmers also tend to be, in their community, very supportive of each other. I mean, I've certainly heard that about the Amish, and I'm making an assumption, I guess, that Mennonite farmers do the same, that you help each other out. That's right. There's a very much of a community emphasis in the church, and a lot of our employees are children of members in the church, and a lot of our products that don't go to farm market are consumed in the church. And yeah, we would be there's 150 members in our church, and about 30 families, and we have a surprising amount of interaction between this family. Mm hmm Well, that sounds very nice, actually, um, that you can be supportive of each other. So, um, how are your farming methods environmentally sustainable? We mentioned uh, the certified organic. Do you want to start there and talk about what that means for your, the agriculture? Sure. Well, certified organic starts with the soil, uh, the requirements, some of the requirements that we face to maintain that certification are that w if we plant any seed, it has to be certified organic seed. Any fertilizer that we use cannot be synthetic. That is, it has to be natural, which is basically saying compost. We use composted animal manure mm -hmm. for fertilizer. We are not to use... Um, uh, products like Roundup would be right. forbidden. Genetically modified feed would be forbidden. Our our farm is about 350 acres of certified organic perennial grassland. Everything that we grow is grass. We grow hay for winter feed and we have pastures for summer feed. Uh, so as far as the certified organic requirements for the animals, we need to bed our animals on certified organic bedding. We can't just go out and buy cheap straw at the auction. We need to buy it from an organic farmer or produce it ourselves. Huh. Our housing requirements for the animals are strict as far as requiring 24-7 access to outdoors and pasture. We can't use, for example, pressure treated fence posts because of the arsenic and the chemicals in the post. There's the possibility of incidental contact with the animals or even an animal chewing on fence posts. So even something as detailed as a fence post has ramifications for producing livestock that are certified organic. Our animals are born and bred on our farm, and when, for example, meat animals go for slaughter, they need to go to a certified organic slaughterhouse, and that slaughterhouse has to 
option as far as that it uses, does not use toxic cleaners or sanitizers, and there's no contact with not organic meat. So it's kind of a long chain from the soil up through the feed and bedding, the animals, the processing, till it comes to the consumer's plate. Organic is very concerned about the integrity of the system. If people start to be skeptical about the certified organic institution, that's really all it has going for it is the integrity that people trust that this product is safe and superior to conventional products. Yeah, it sounds like um, I'm. Th I find this reassuring because. Um, you know, I have my doubts sometimes about, you know, uh, the regulations that, uh, now this is coming from the USDA, correct? That's right, but there's also dozens of independent certifiers that are answer to the USDA. That you get involved in at the local level? Right. We are, for example, we are certified by Pennsylvania Certified Organic which is obviously a Pennsylvania certifier that answers to the USDA as far as meeting their requirements, but Pennsylvania has its own concerns and interests, and those, those are addressed in a local certifier. I see, but you are also, through this certification, able to um, transport interstate lines? Across. That's right, and we're able to use, for example, the USDA logo which is the most recognized logo. The yes. Pennsylvania Certified Organic logo wouldn't probably mean too much to you folks in Virginia. Right, and you're absolutely right. I, I advise my clients to look for that USDA Certified um, Organic logo because it is so recognizable now. Um, but it sounds like quite a process. How long did it take you to become Certified Organic? Well, we spent about seven years we had been farming organically, but not not following all the stringent requirements and didn't have the paperwork, so we basically had to start at zero. It takes three years of operating organically before you're considered organic, and then you're not free to just buy animals and say, well, we're an organic farm, and so now these are organic animals, but animals have to be born and bred on an organic farm. Mm -hmm. So it was about seven years until we had our entire operation certified. Wow. And do you feel it's worth it? I do. Um, I don't know that it changed very many significant things in how we operate, but the credibility and the recognition that comes with certification, we feel like it's, it's well worth the effort and expense of maintaining it. Right, because I have talked to some other farmers who just kind of gave up, I think. Like they looked into it or they might have started down that path, but they thought it was either too expensive or too heavy a burden, I guess. On well, them. it is expensive and it is complicated. It's a, it's a daunting thing. For at least three years, you're spending all the money and doing all the paperwork to operate organically and cannot claim any of your products to be organic, that's a, that's a real obstacle. Yeah. So would you like to see the process be a little less uh, op uh, onerous? I'm not sure that I would. I really don't see much about it that I, that I would say was, was wasteful. If anything, we would probably lobby for a, a more stringent process. We'd, see some areas where there's starting to be looseness as the larger operators get in. Um, there's concessions being made and to the point where industrial agriculture is kind of looking closely at organic and they're starting, those lines are starting to blur. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't mind if it was, if it held on to its family farming emphasis where corporations and large animal operations, concentrated animal feeding operations called CAFOs, yes. would be excluded just by the design of their facilities. 
I'm totally. Regardless of what they're feeding and maybe they're not using drugs, it's still 50,000 birds under one roof. It's kind of like an organic Twinkie. It just, something just doesn't sound right about it. Right. I, I often think of those as these sort of factory farms. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know if you've read Omnivore's Dilemma, but he does a really good job of profiling a CAFO versus a uh, polyface farm, for example. Yeah, I have read that, and that's, I'd recommend that book highly to anybody that's interested in some of these issues. Right, and it goes back to, you know, why do I buy my meat and dairy from you? And it's for that very reason. I don't I feel that your methods have, and the certified organic methods that you use and that certification that you have, do have integrity. Um, and I know where my, you know, I call it sourcing. I know where my food is coming from. And I also know that the animals are being raised humanely. And I don't know if you remember the conversation we had, but I, Part of why I brought up, excuse me, your um, faith is because I'm actually a practicing uh, Buddhist and our philosophy is that every uh, living being, including animals, um, are really not, we don't want to make them suffer, um, you know, especially unnecessarily. So to be honest, I struggled with whether I should even be eating animal protein, but as a nutritionist, I feel that it's important for me to get the nutrients, the iron, the certain minerals, the B12, the B vitamins that come with with meat. Um, and so one of the things, you know, we talked about is how you treat your animals. And do you want to just talk about that, how you treat them humanely? I felt I couldn't do any better, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I've often said to people that uh, not necessarily wishing I had been born an animal, but if I had been, I'd be very happy to be an animal on my farm. Uh, this, the pasture-based system is really at the foundation of what we're doing, and whether it's turkeys running around on a couple hundred acres with no fences, or chickens free-ranging on green grass, chasing bugs and producing eggs, or uh, pigs out in the fresh air and sunshine, our lambs, our beef cattle, and our dairy cattle, all, all they know is being on green grass. And um, that, to me, is the height of um, animal welfare, treating animals humanely and in a respectful way. Um, we've found that we've practically eliminated the veterinarian. Um, we don't have a drug cabinet. We don't have a vet coming out making routine checks for the herd because our, we have tremendous longevity and just wonderful animal health. And it seems to us like a no-brainer. We have contact with a lot of neighbors that are conventional agriculture and we just see the vet truck sailing from farm to farm to farm, taking care of, trying to rescue animals that are basically being uh, manipulated against nature to a point that they're sick and propped up with antibiotics and hormones. And right. We just have no desire to participate in that. Right. And I just want to say a quick word, too, about what you were saying a minute ago, that I think... Um, I would love to see more support for the family-owned farms, the smaller farmer, than these, you know, commercially factory farms, uh, industrial farms, agriculture. Because I do think when people talk about, oh, you know, you shouldn't eat meat because, you know, it's ruining the environment, those are the ones that are ruining the environment. It's not people like you. So I think it's important, a lot of people don't want to delve, and I hope the show may enlighten them, about the difference between the farming methods and the environmental sustainability of what you're doing 
versus these CAFOs and factory farms? Well, there's really no comparison. For example, if we consider our beef herd out on pasture to, uh, to beef animals at a CAFO, we've been accused, the beef producers, I'll say, of greenhouse gas problems, producing mm -hmm. carbon dioxide and uh, creating problems with the ozone and in the atmosphere. But uh, what people don't understand when they're supporting our type of agriculture, 100% grass-fed, is that we're on a perennial pasture system that sequesters incredible amounts, vast numbers of tons per acre of carbon because a pasture-based system sequesters carbon as organic matter in the soil. And our farm is building soil depth, and we've more than tripled our level of of organic carbon in the soil because of perennial pastures. So beef kind of has a bad name as the problem is it's grain-fed beef in a concentrated animal feeding operation that would be guilty. And unfortunately, red meat gets kind of tarred and feathered along with the grain-fed aberration. Oh, absolutely. And then um, people you know, have been pushing, and don't get me wrong, plant, you know, based foods certainly have their place, but, you know, people have sworn off meat for often because of that reason, and I think that they have, that's an important distinction. Um, the details, you know, about what the animals eat and how are they raised is really critical. Um, and from a nutrition standpoint, because when you, there's a lot of research out now, and Michael Pollan does a good job of explaining this, and he cites some of the research in his book. He's the author of Omnivore's Dilemma. He's a food journalist. Um, he talks about that in comparison studies of meat that comes from cows, for example, that have been fed grain versus grass, the grass-fed ones have more omega-3, which is an essential fatty acid. And there, it's also leaner. So I think, you know, from a nutrition standpoint, you're going to get more value, more nutrients from grass-fed meat as well. Yeah, I would agree with you. I could probably be accused of being biased, but right. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, and that's why I like to cite his... his uh, uh, book because, you know, as a journalist, he really isn't biased. He doesn't have anything to gain from it. So, but um, I also, I think the taste, to be honest, you know, having bought many uh, different kinds of meat from you and, um, you know, it's just superior. <laughs> you know, just yeah, on a well, pure taste we're level. <laughs> we're glad that people like our products. It, it doesn't mean very much to farm sustainably and uh, ethically, if it ultimately has to get to market and support the farmer. So we always tell our farm market customers they're a critical part of the equation that doesn't work without them. Right, exactly. And then that that's what I would love my listeners, one of the messages I want to uh, convey here is just that, you know, please support your local farmer. You know, if, if we all do that, it really can make a difference. Um, and also, you know, you offer, you know, um, as you pointed out, whole milk, um, and it's delicious, and, you know, even if you don't have to have a large amount of milk, but there are many benefits, including this healthy fat that you get, as well as the calcium and so on for bone health. Um, and also, I wanted just to go back to grass-fed for a minute. Um, what is the difference, you know, there are all these terms that are being bandied about, have been for a while. So 100% grass-fed, um, should I assume that means grass-finished as well? So it's grass-fed all the way through, the, the animals eat grass all the way through their That's life right. cycle. There's a, there was a time that grass-fed was enough, and if you had grass-fed meat or grass-fed milk, that's all they eat, but it's gotten to the point where an animal in a CAFO that bends down and snips off a little sprig of grass, tech 
technically is a grass-fed animal, just not fed very much grass. Mm -hmm. We've kind of been backed into the corner of having to use the term 100% grass-fed simply because we could tell our customers needed to know that. They would ask us, where was this animal born? What did it eat when it was a calf or a lamb? Um, what does it eat over the winter? And we knew we were being quizzed by people who felt they'd been lied to and felt abused by the term grass-fed. So right. we're, we're not attorneys and we don't want to make it complicated, but my challenge to anyone that's buying something that says grass-fed is to ask a simple question. Is 100% grass-fed. Right, and I, I or think... It's been fed green. Right, exactly, because I know that term grass finished is one of those sort of um, hybrid situations where they've been fed grain or um, corn or even soy, which are GMO products, um, for most of their lives, and then at the very end of their life cycle, they get fed grass. So <laughs> that's kind of cheating, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, it does seem that way. So let's talk about free range. Um, I know you use the term free range with, associated with your chicken, and of course your chickens are laying eggs, but you also sell chickens, right? We do. Mm -hmm. So to, why don't you describe what, uh, how they're managed or how they're raised in, in with that free range description. Sure. Well, I'm glad you changed gears from grass-fed to free range because poultry the term grass-fed connected with poultry is pretty well meaningless. Um, chickens, whether they're producing meat or eggs, are able to consume some grass. The same could be said for pigs. But uh, I'd say just about a biological impossibility to raise a productive animal on grass. So we would allow a layer mash or a broiler mash or a twine feed that would be GMO free and avoid the GMO corn, GMO soy. Um, we include free range for all of our poultry and to us free range means nothing stops the animal but the animal itself. So for our turkeys, we have pictures of our turkeys up to a mile away from their housing and they spend the day grazing out and spend the day grazing back, and, but they do spend time eating a grain ration and just would not be able to produce meat or eggs without that. So a free range ought to mean free, totally free range. That's what, what we mean when we say it, but that's kind of like the grass-fed term. It's gotten to the point that 50,000 birds with a three-foot-wide door onto a 12-foot concrete pad passes muster for free range and there's no birds out there they don't want to go out there they're afraid to be outside they're born and bred indoors and so the grocery store free range eggs are just um i don't know i, I don't know how somebody sleeps at night calling those eggs or that chicken free range and in my mind if the animal can't get its belly full of bugs and green grass and clover and whatever it might find interesting to peck at. It's, it's not free range. Mm -hmm. So are your poultry housed? Where are they housed then? Okay. The, both, both layers and broilers, which would be meat birds, would be in hoop housing, which overnight they need to be indoors to be protected from predators. Uh -huh. During the day, we still have trouble with predators. It's kind of the, the downside to free-ranging is that there are losses. We have had anything from bald eagles to coyotes to foxes. Um, just Sweet red hogs, it seems like. We just have keep alive a pretty good population around our farm with daytime predatory losses, but Hmm. We do shut down predatory losses at night by penning up the animal. And that would include the turkeys as well. Yes, that's okay. right. Uh -huh. But that's wonderful. I can just imagine a, a turkey a hundred miles away. <laughs> uh, but they want to come in. They like their um, 
well, if I understood you correctly, they're free range and they're eating out when they're sort of foraging outdoors and the grasses and the bugs and so on. That's when they're out during the day doing their own thing, kind of. That's right. Turkeys are powerful grazers. They actually do very well on grass and bugs and plant matter. Um, it's my understanding that ducks would be a little more aggressive foragers and geese. I understand would be the only poultry that can do really well with no grain whatsoever, no grain supplement, just on grass. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for poultry that has had the maximum amount of its diet from grazing and foraging, turkey is, is better than chicken. Chicken is probably limited to 25% of its intake being from forage, where turkeys I understand are closer to fifty percent. Hmm. So it really it varies by type of poultry. It does. It varies a lot. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, um, just to kind of finish the conversation about the humane treatment, the other thing that uh, impressed me about your philosophy is that you didn't want the animals to feel, you know, any pain or any more pain than they needed to. And I think you talked about using a stun gun. Um, as a way of sort of immobilizing them before they're slaughtered. Is that something that you implement or that the slaughterhouse implements? Well, that's a requirement of uh, any certified organic slaughterhouse is that they would use a uh, captive bull, which is a, a manner of stunning that then the animal's rendered unconscious and they're then the slaughter is a, is a bleeding out process. But what's nice about that, and it's not very nice to talk about slaughter, but that it not be a trauma for the animal. And you can imagine if guns are being used, that uh, that would traumatize animals that are in a holding pen or something. This is this is a silent, a silent painless slaughter. And I said I wouldn't necessarily want make it my goal in life to be an animal, but if I was going to be an animal, I would like to be on my farm. And I'm not looking to go in the wrong door of a slaughterhouse, but if I had to, I would be very comfortable with a, a process like we expose our animals to. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was, you know, going my, back to what I said earlier about Buddhist philosophy and sentient beings. I mean, that was important to me you know, that they don't suffer unnecessarily. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about um, just the sort of the life of being a farmer. Um, I would assume it's farming is a 24-7 occupation. Um, it's, it's, you don't get necessarily, you know, a lot of time off from it. And I was wondering what keeps you going. Yeah, well, there's financial realities, I imagine, everyone faces. There's mornings you wouldn't mind uh, not having to get up early or stay up late, but um, we're very motivated. We have a vision for our farm and what we want to do, and we enjoy our work. It does have its ebbs and flows. It's a seasonal work. We do our milking operations seasonally and that means we dry off our entire herd and give them a two month rest every winter hmm. and that fits the farm market schedule so we are able to work at side projects repairs construction projects on the farm spend a little more time with family do a little travel in january and february hmm. the rest of the year is pretty much a uh, busy, long week, um, probably more hours than most people would realize. Yeah, I can believe uh, it, just from uh, reading uh, the description on your website of, <laughs> of what your children are involved in as well, I thought everybody there seems to, end to have a job, and, and uh, it just sounds super busy. Yeah, it is, and, but it's nice to be able to be around the family and work with the family and if something goes wrong we had one of our uh, church members come down with an 
infection the other day and was hospitalized and we had the flexibility to run up and visit and somebody's barn burns down we're able to go help with rebuilding that's one nice thing about farming is we're not necessarily beholden to a time clock right yeah i know exactly the, what you're saying because I'm self-employed and, and that's one of the things the benefits of it is I can set my own schedule mm -hmm. um, which you know allows you to focus on things that you think are important and to also you're out of course in in nature I would think because that's another benefit yeah there really aren't any unpleasant jobs on the farm the only, the only time farming gets unpleasant is when Right, right. Just about nothing is fun when uh, when you're under the gun, but we try to manage things and not be. We do some scrambling around, but we try to not make that be normal. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, what's your biggest challenge? Um. I guess the the biggest thing we have to face with direct marketing, what we're trying to do with our farm products. It's educating the consumer who is seeing the Walmart, Costco, even Whole Foods model and comparing what we're doing and saying, uh, I, I can get organic milk at Walmart for $7 a gallon and yours is 9 Here I am buying directly from the farmer. Why am I paying extra for that privilege? And what we'd like for people to understand is that there's a lot of costs built into low-priced food. And if anyone came here and studied our lifestyle and watched us work, you could pretty quickly determine that what we're being returned for our product is basically a fair living. There's very few wealthy farmers, and we work hard for our money, but we don't have a lot of the industrial farming efficiencies. But our food supply system is, is built on those massive, efficient, food production operations, and so we've forgotten the fact that, that there's a lot of subsidies in that and a lot of sacrifices of quality and humane care of animals. And I, I would just like people to understand that if they go back pre-industrial agriculture, back before World War II, and look at what a chunk roast cost or a leg of lamb or a gallon of milk and adjust those figures forward to today, they would see that certified organic 100% grass-fed is actually right on track with what food cost in the first half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And so I would like people to have their, their mindset reset and recognize that 99 cent a pound ground beef is an aberration. Yeah, and absolutely. And I would like them to have the long view long-term view as well that that eventually may not be sustainable um, you know with these large industrial agricultural methods and what you're doing is more sustainable so speaking of your products uh, do you want to tell people about your website and if they can order products online and how the process works well sure we'd be glad for anybody that was interested in what we're doing to visit our website. It's www.colterfarms.net and Coulter is C-O-U-L-T-E-R. We have a lot of pictures and slideshow and a blog and online store. Some of our products can be shipped UPS. A lot of them we deliver in the central Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C. metro area, so I'd invite anyone to check it out. There's some links. I'd also like to recommend eatwild.com and realmilk.com are two places to learn about 100% grass-fed because I feel like that, that really is a message I'd like to see getting out is that people would move away from grain-based agriculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen to that. Also, with your website, I want to just say that um, it's important to emphasize, uh, I'm sorry, to capitalize the C and the F. So, capital C and capital F for farms.net. 
Um, and also, do you ship beyond local, the local area? If people are in California, for example, can they still order online with you? Yeah, our age cheeses and honey and some of our shelf stable uh, bee sticks and those kind of things. We're not very, we can ship all of those. We're not very high tech as far as shipping frozen and refrigerated food. Mm -hmm. So I really can't encourage anyone to pursue that through us. Okay. And then um, do you ship beyond the U.S. or just within the U.S.? Uh, we haven't shipped internationally that I'm aware of. I'm okay. Sorry, I'm not sure what's involved in that. That's all right. And if people have questions, can they email you? Yeah, we'd be happy to hear from you. I'd, I'd recommend you just click on contact us on the website. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Kinley, for being on the Real World Wellness Podcast today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. I want to thank you, too, for the opportunity to express my views. Sure, absolutely. So next episode, I will be talking about bone health and bone density, how to measure it and prevent losing bone density, and what you can do if you, like me, already have osteopenia. So thanks, everyone, and have a great, healthy day.